What's going on, everybody? My name is C4. Welcome back to the channel. Today, we're here for the offseason of our Madden 24 Arizona Cardinals franchise mode. Our first offseason. And there are plenty of things we need to do before we can get into free agency, before we get into the draft, before we can meet some of these draft players. First up is the first initial wave of retirements where we say goodbye to our backup quarterback, Colt McCoy, whose real value on the squad was he had a mentorship tag, which gave Kyler Murray and Clayton Toon an additional XP boost. We have Matt Prater going out on top. I don't blame him. He was the best kicker in the NFL this year. Got a Pro Bowl snub, which was downright disrespectful. So he's probably just saying, the league ain't for me anymore. I want to get out. But the last big piece of business, before we could go any further, we need a new leader. Jonathan Gannon is the worst head coach in the NFL. Throughout this entire process, he's made boneheaded decisions. He played Kyler Murray in the preseason, which re-aggravated his injury and cost him the first month and a bit of the NFL season. If that didn't happen, who knows where we're at as a squad. Outside of that, just an absolute loser, total nerd, not a guy that inspires confidence, an absolute clown, has no respect of his team, not even that good of a defensive coach. He came in here as a defensive guru, defensive mastermind and exactly what did we get we had what were our rankings here again sorry real quick this defensive head coach oh we were just 38 points a game 32nd in the league 300 yards against through the air 32nd in the league a buck 50 on the ground 32nd in a league there is nothing about this guy that offers any sense of redeeming qualities so we need to get ourselves a new head coach, a new leader, a man that can lead this Cardinals team to a Super Bowl. I'm tired, man. We got an off. I still got to get ready for the offseason. We got to get ready for free agency. We got to get ready for the draft. And I am exhausted trying to find our new head coach here for the Arizona Cardinals. Has to be the right fit. We went to college. My top two candidates were in college. First up, Lincoln Riley didn't even pick up the phone. Thought about that. You know, he craps out Heisman Trophy winners. Innovative offense. The college offense is becoming more and more involved in the NFL. It'd be a perfect fit for Kyler Murray. And this offense didn't even pick up the phone. Called Coach Prime. Deion Sanders down there in Colorado building something special. Maybe less refined offensively. But that guy's an absolute motivator. He would have this team ready to run through a wall. He didn't even pick up. I thought Coach Prime would be a little bit of a bag chaser. Giving him a blank check to come here to Arizona. Nope. Didn't even pick up the phone. I also... Called, you know, from an offensive standpoint. John the game was defense. We need offense. I called our good old buddy Chip Kelly down there in UCLA. And he, you know, words were said. Words were said. We'll just leave it at that. And I don't think that's the direction we want to go. He had some trade ideas. You know, from an offensive standpoint, I actually think Chip Kelly could work again in today's NFL. But then it kind of came down to like he wanted some role in the general managing department. Gave me a couple trade scenarios that he was thinking about. And I was like, nah. Nah, I'm good. He's, he, he, I'll just say this. He wanted to trade Owen Popo, Kyler Murray, and BJ Ozolari. Like our three best players. And he wanted to trade them for Kiko Alonso. So I said, nah, putting our foot down there, Chip. I don't think we're going to we're gonna mingle in the college game. Then we had some wild cards. We had Keith Taylor's dad. Keith Taylor said his dad's pretty good at all batting. He plays Madden 06 on the GameCube on all that. And I was like, okay, we'll bring him in. It was an interesting interview. But I, I think that's a little too out there. Brought in Larry Fitzgerald, a legend. Larry legend. I know a lot of people want to see Larry Fitzgerald come in. But we did that last year with the Carolina Panthers. We brought in Luke Keekley as our head coach. Saw some, some decent results, right? I, I think at the end of the day, ended up winning a Super Bowl with Luke Keekley. But, you know, he started, he worked it way up. He was started as our head scout. Was in the building for a little bit. Then he got promoted. I, I feel like definitely want to bring Larry Fitzgerald into the building. He's a guy that I'm going to recommend to our new head coach. Maybe we'll bring him on as a wide receiver coach. And we'll, we'll keep tabs on Larry. And if things don't work out with our new hire, Larry Fitzgerald is going to be in the building now as a member of our coaching staff. And we could potentially elevate him at a later date. But as it stands right now, I think it's just a little too big of a jump for Larry Fitzgerald. But we will bring him in and get him started as a coach. So that, you know, who knows? Maybe someday. And then lastly, probably the most popular pipeline to becoming a new NFL head coach. We looked at some offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators. We had three real, real extensive interviews. We had, you know, we interviewed, casted a wide net. But uh, our final three that we just didn't decide. One was Eric Bieniemy. I mean, long time, can he get a head coaching job? He's now down there with the Commanders. Commanders offense wasn't really anything particularly special. 
So I think we're going to go in a little bit of a different direction. We've got Louis Amarillo in, defensive coordinator of the Cincinnati Bengals. And I just, I just think in today's NFL, you, you, unless you're like a rare case like a D'Amico Ryans, where you're a great defensive coordinator and clearly like a leader that can elevate a locker room and change a culture like D'Amico, I think that's the direction to go. Didn't really get those vibes from Louis Amarillo. So we have narrowed down who I think is going to be the right man for this job. The best thing about this deal is it wasn't a long-term contract. Didn't take five years, six year contract to get this one to sign the dotted line, even though that's not that big of an issue. So, ladies and gentlemen, your brand new head coach of the Arizona Cardinals for the next two seasons, at least. Please welcome. We're going with Ben Johnson, former offensive coordinator of the Detroit Lions, and really the big name for the 2024 head coaching cycle as it stands. If you can't get yourself a Lincoln Riley, a Coach Prime, one of those big things from college, and they weren't even picking up the phone for us. Ben Johnson, what he's been able to accomplish with, let's be honest, Jared Goff, and pretty underwhelming offense in Detroit, has been remarkable. In 2022, Detroit was literally their best offense they've ever had historically in a franchise mode. You got Jared Goff, went over 4,000 yards passing. They had over 2,000 yards rushing collectively as an offense, and he is getting a little bit of a reputation as a quarterback guru so i think with ben johnson we only had to get him on a two-year deal it wasn't some big long-term commitment if things don't work out so be it we're gonna have other things in the pipeline we'll keep tabs on your larry Fitzgeralds. we'll keep tabs on the coaches in college maybe coach prime in a couple years time will want to make that jump to come help us out here in arizona maybe keith taylor's dad will stop playing madden on 07 gamecube and maybe get on next gen a little bit and take his interview a little bit more seriously. But I think as it stands right now, the big fish that we could realistically at is Ben Johnson. And I'm excited to see what he can do, what he can bring to the offense. And with that, his coaching staff highlights, he stole away JT Barrett, former Ohio State quarterback, who is currently the assistant quarterback coach of the Detroit Lions. He has joined us as a quarterback coach. We have Larry Fitzgerald as our wide receiver coach, kind of headlining the offensive staff. And on the defensive side of the ball, not a lot of connections for Ben Johnson. It's not like he's a guy that's been at 80 different places that we could really pull from, from the Rolodex. So we kind of had to stay within the Detroit Lions where he's been there for five seasons. And with a first time head coach, younger head coach, I do think there's value, at least on the defensive side of the ball, having some leadership, having some experience and a guy that you know, has also had some really good football in the NFL. This is a guy that has been to the Super Bowl. This is a guy that has unfortunately lost two Super Bowls, but he's been to two Super Bowls, has had a lot of success, has bounced around the league a little bit. Current Detroit Lions senior defensive assistant, former head coach of the Carolina Panthers and Denver Broncos. Our DC this year is going to be John Fox. Stealing him away from the Detroit Lions, fits and ticks off. Everything that I want to look for right now to kind of finish out our coaching staff. Brings the experience, has been there, done that. Gives us a little bit of a different look on the defensive side of the ball. We're going to be using the New Orleans Saints defensive playbook as Dennis Allen is a part of the John Fox coaching tree. Was really actually at one point labeled the true disciple of John Fox when John Fox's defenses were really, really good. So hopefully that is going to be something that can bring our defense up from being 32nd ranked in every measurable category. So we've been pretty frugal with how we spent our staff points last season. We didn't invest any in Gannon because we knew that likely was going to be a one and done. We're going to pull Steve Wilkes to have a tie back to previous Arizona head coaches. But our OC, you know, this is where we definitely work down quarterback duo, which is huge for our offense. Happy to have that uh, along with obviously, you know, the new guys coming in, Larry Fitzgerald and company on the defensive side. We also, I thought maybe we'd have a little bit more upgrades here for John Fox, given his years in the league, but not necessarily the end of the world. We got the nice plus three speed boost for corners coming in right now, and we're going to be able to flush this out because I have every bit of expectations that we're going to win a lot more games next year, and the more you win games, the more staff points you're going to be able to spend. And again, we haven't really been able to dip in here to the general manager tab and help with player retention and free agency, which... You know, it would help, but we'll get there eventually. But with our 41 points that are carrying over into this season, we do need to start spending here for Ben Johnson. we got to decide which is going to be the most important. Offensive development, which I will prioritize this one first because he is an offensive-minded head coach. And there's going to be some nice gains here. We can go probably more so on the left-hand side 
which is skill position players. Uh, and then obviously we get down here, down to the QBs, which would be huge. But I think for the time being, you know, I, I will say give credit to the defensive tree. Even though we're not a defensive guy, the final piece is huge because all players will count on our team as scheme fits during training, which is extra XP. But I think as it stands right now, I, I think we got to prioritize just getting after school tutoring, getting three additional focus training slots, three additional opportunities that we can hop in and play mini games and try to roll some dev traits. I think given the landscape of Madden 24 and that being like a feature in this game, while these first seven are just, you gotta, you know, that's a, they're tough pills to swallow because you never really got to utilize these. I have no intentions of firing John Fox or my offensive coordinator. So a lot of these are just, just is what it is. But um, we'll work our way down. We'll go defensive side just, just to help out John Fox here, get his legs back under him. Now as a defensive coordinator, but I, I think we're going to prioritize all these points that we earn, likely almost all the points that we'll get in our first year here with Ben Johnson as our head coach are probably going to have to go right into the staff mods so we can get all the way down there to after school tutoring and get those additional three slots. Something that I noticed that was kind of funny here, mock draft three, it's still really early. Like, you know, even though we have a couple players that we like, Kenny Hodges, Marcus House are really the big two names as it stands right now, but we have a legitimate potential pick here at first overall is curtis white the left tackle from notre dame is on our short list double a's there the b pass block i would say for us to really consider him first overall we'd have to scout and get that run blocking at least an a three a's minimum for me to be drafting a tackle first overall but it's funny that like that that still is kind of reasonable get a big time franchise tackle now that we got a legitimate head coach in when jonathan gana was our head coach it was like these mock guys can we make the stupidest pick possible kyle silas I don't even think he's not even on the short list anymore. That's who we're projecting because Jonathan Gain is an idiot. Mock draft two, we have Alex Alvarez from Utah State. Also looks equally terrible. And now in mock draft three, where's that guy? Nowhere to be found. So it, it is kind of funny. When we had a bad head coach, two busts of picks. We bring in an exciting head coach and we have somewhat a realistic option. I just thought that was entertaining. So the pre-early free agency, we have our last opportunity to re-sign players. This could be a bloodbath because not only are we going to decide here, we're also going to go to the main roster and we'll make cuts. We're going to be able to trim this roster. This is going to look drastically different. But let's see who is currently safe to hit the open market that we want to keep. First up, we have Zayvon Collins, who I think right now is worth picking up the fifth-year option over 100 tackles last year. Has kind of been a, you know, tweener weapon, if you will, outside linebacker, inside linebacker. I think I like him inside. I think him and Owen Papo made a really nice combo in the middle of our defense. Um, whether or not we stay in the scheme, John Fox has run both fronts, but I believe he's more for three. At least that's what he was when he was in Denver. And that could work. I mean, honestly, I want to just, I want to go into the draft and free agency being very flexible with our scheme. If we're going to be a four, three or a three, four, if there's really good linebackers and we're going to be running three linebackers more, Zayvon Collins, Kaiser White, Owen Papo. There's a couple in the draft that look really nice. Could utilize that. If we stay with a 3-4, you know, we just stay with what we had. Papo, Zayvon Collins, Kaiser White as depth. So I think either way, we're going to be flexible at linebacker, and I do think we should continue to develop Zayvon Collins. Michael Carter was impressive. I think Michael Carter and Corey Clement were the two running backs that were that were pretty exciting and did a lot with limited touches. So I think I'd like to keep Michael Carter here. We'll give him a two-year contract offer, and I think he should be vibing for more opportunities. Greg Dortch... Eh, uh, Greedy Williams was not really that great on the outside. Kelvin Joseph was kind of a flyer. I mean, in terms of like, who do we want to keep? Wang Wu, return man, but didn't really offer a lot as a return man. And I think I'd rather go elsewhere. You might be able to get someone a little bit more affordable in the draft. That is like a return specialist. Uh, Marlon Mack didn't play. Role players on the defense. LJ Collier flashed here or there, but didn't really live up to the billing of like, hey, can this former first round boss really turn it around here in Arizona? Bardo just... Couldn't get snaps. I would be interested in maybe bringing him back, but not at that price point. I think we let him at the open market. Uh, we could probably get him back for closer to vet minimum. Um, these are kind of just like, you know, our depth players here. Again, I I think almost all these. Koontz was a rookie, very good athlete. Jake Witt, very good athlete. I think these are guys that maybe we look at bringing back on the open market for way more reasonable money. Like, what is Jake Witt's contract? That is... I could probably get him three years, $3 million if we let him at the open market. So there's just not a lot of value right now trying to get ahead of the market. Rosen, Elfline can move on, Watkins. 
Uh, I wasn't even, even the punt god, man. He was. I just couldn't get it going. I thought we'd be cheesy. I thought we'd be hitting gongs left, right, and center. Nope. Maybe he lost it from his from his year off. So I I wasn't overly impressed there. Uh, we got the fullback, who's uh, you know just wearing the hat. Do we want to even pay? I don't even want to pay for a fullback. I don't want to pay for a fullback. So we are gonna let all the remaining players hit the open market, and in some cases we'll see if we can get them back, like an Amari Barno, like a Jake Witt, on the open market price, not nine million dollars for three years. That's ridiculous. How it's time. We got the shears out. We're going to trim the fat. If you did not justify a spot on this roster last season, you're gone. Quarterback room, Kyler Murray, Clayton Toon, both justified their spot. In the running back room, we got Michael Carter, we got James Conner, we got Corey Clement, and Keontae Ingram. Ingram, almost a million dollars, not seeing the field. I think if we could get more money by releasing James Conner, I'd be interested. But, I mean, he, he's going to relegate to an RB3 at this point. And still offers us a little bit of power back ability if we ever need to kind of change it up a little bit. Plus, I like James Conner at the end of the day. So I think if there was more cap savings, I'd probably move on. But right now, that's not too bad and not an overly expensive running back room. I do want to try to model our running back room after the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, the wide receiver room. Okay, well, we got Speedster, Bo Melton. And we don't need both Bo Mountain and Anthony Schwartz. They're kind of our shot play, speedster, practice squad guys. And Schwartz does have slightly better catching. And he's slightly faster. So I think we're gonna we're gonna move on from Bo Melton. Just because just because that's one of those like big ones. Almost a million dollars. Uh Zach Pascal was a solid slot, but we just have too much depth at that position. And I think we can get a little bit more, you know, get a little bit of salary cap relief there. A little bit extra spending, but Hollywood Brown, Rondell Moore, Michael Wilson, Calvin Austin, Swartz, and Basella uh, look decent, and I probably butchered that name again. We got Trey McBride, our superstar tight end, who we're definitely keeping, even though we are very much watching House, that freak athlete, not the doctor show, that freak athlete in the draft. Uh, I've seen plenty of people throw some suggestions out. We could look at making, you know, Trey McBride a slot or House a slot, depending on the athletic testing. I'm not ruling it out, but we definitely need to add some bodies here to the tight end room. Uh, I want to roster four. And we only have one on the roster. So we'll see. We'll see what free agency kind of holds. Zach Koontz was on our practice squad. We could look at bringing him back on a cheap deal. Uh, DJ Humphreys, I mean, just tough to move on from at this point. He's still a star dev lineman. Is tugging at my Florida Gator heartstrings. Was not a liability, but obviously with that contract right now, just not feasible to get you know cheaper at that position. Dotson was awesome. I love Kevin Dotson. What a trade it was getting him from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Awesome. Laid out pancakes. Made a couple highlight reel blocks. Uh, we have John Gaines, who's solid depth at center. We got Froholt, solid, I guess, all things considered. Just could maybe move on from him, though. Like, we'll see how the depth kind of flushes out here at center because there are reasonable savings. Right guard, we got Will Hernandez, Wyatt Davis, and Hayes. Yeah, fine. Paris Johnson at right tackle. We're not going to be touching there. Defensive line, again, it's fluid because I don't know what our front is going to be. So we will kind of just keep everyone there as is. These are guys upside. Kinlaw broke out for us last year. Uh, these here are almost all going to be pass rushers if we switch to a 4-3. But Ojolari, X-Factor, expectations really high. We got Ronnie Perkins, who we stole from the Patriots practice squad. Uh, and the Canadian, Jesse Lochetta. Not a lot of savings if we got rid of them, so we'll just kind of keep them as, as depth. Now, here's an interesting one. I think Kaiser White is good depth. I think also pretty expensive for a guy that we're not utilizing right now. But if we do shift to a 4-3... You know, we don't have... He'd be a starter. He would be a valuable starter for us because it would be White, Papo, and Collins if the draft doesn't fall our way to get a linebacker. So I would say for the time being, even though that's really nice savings, if we did move on from Kaiser White, who didn't play a lot last year, I think because it's still undetermined if we're going to be 4-3 or 3-4, I think we'll keep him. We'll keep him right now on the books. And on the other side, we got... I mean, White Lawrence Taylor. Yeah, right. Lost that nickname. Uh, no real savings. So I'll... Can't really, can't really tighten the books around the linebacking room. The second there, we got Michael Wilson, Garrett Williams, and the former former rookie, because he's going to second year, uh, Keetra Clark. Again, just no real savings there. We'll keep those depths. Jalen Thompson. We got Melifonu at free safety. Keith Taylor, savings, but we're not getting rid of that guy. You get rid of that guy, he's just going to curse the whole frigging locker room. And while we can enjoy the fact that we have the first overall pick, the 27th overall pick, pick 33, 60, 65, 70, 91, 92, 97. And we're going to do some absolute damage with those picks. 
we need to try and fill out our roster because we get some salary cap here on the open market. I'm just going to kind of break down positionally who I may try to target because, you know, before we get our active negotiation, we're going to be active on all days. We have a lot of spots here uh, that we need to get filled on our roster. For the quarterback room, some interesting names. No prolific quarterback. No one that's S tier. I think someone like Tyler Huntley could be interesting if we want to continue to get backups that can be mobile. I think if I want to just personally get players that I like and we get to maybe a little bit later in free agency and he's still available, Florida Gator bias. Kyle Trask, interested coming in as a backup, but I'm going to be honest, I don't really think that'd be worth spending our buddy 84 throw power. It is kind of brutal. Uh, we got 90 throw power on Carson Strong. That's that's kind of interesting. He's in Felipe Franks here. Ooh, Felipe Franks could be a nice get. 84 speed. Got a decent cannon. Maybe that'll be a guy, but we're not going to target those day one. Same with the running backs. I really do think we saw enough out of Corey Clement and Michael Carter. Like, that could be our backs, but there are... I think mean, Austin Eckler would be a hell of a get for the offense. Uh, versatile Webby, you try to think, like, how do they run utilize running backs in Detroit? Now, some of that does come down to Deuce Staley, who's a terrible in-game running back coach. I think he's a great developer of running backs, but his rotations are incredibly frustrating. We saw it last year with Jamal Williams and DeAndre Swift. We saw it week one against the Chiefs or Lions with David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs. So it's a running back spot that I don't think, you know, I said it when we're breaking down the running backs. I kind of want to model my running back room after the Philadelphia Eagles. I don't want to pay a lot. So yes, there's some value here. J.K. Dobbins, Antonio Gibson, A.J. Dillon. A.J. Dillon would be fun. I think it would be really fun having like a pure power back with a little bit more upside than James Conner or James Robinson and stuff like that. I just think with our running back room as it is, I don't think we need much for three deep. Maybe having a fourth running back could add some value, but I think as it stands right now, we're probably not going to be investing here. If not, it'll be later in free agency. Don't really, really utilize a fullback too, too much. So I think this will be some, maybe if we find a fullback late in the seventh round in the draft, that could be good, has some good stats. That's where we would go. Wide receivers. This is an interesting one for our squad because we feel pretty good about Rondell Moore. Feel optimistic that Hollywood Brown can cut out the drops and still going to be a nice deep threat. But you look at what we're missing for our wide receiver. We don't really have that jump ball guy. We have plenty of shifty slot speed, but we don't have a jump ball guy. The top wide receiver available is Mike Williams, and he has some interest in potentially joining our squad. 6'4", 220. I think if we also want to look for that build of wide receiver, you have DPJ here, Donovan Peoples-Jones, 6'2", 205. Maybe not as jump ball-y as Mike Williams, but there is no interest we do have $66 million for the salary cap, so I'm not necessarily saying players with no interest will be completely off our off our radar here because we can overpay. We can come to the table with a pretty big bid, but it would be nice, and it'd be easier because how many guys we do need to try to bring in if we don't have to be hitting players with very player-friendly offers to even have a shot at bringing in. we got Quez Watkins, channel legend, but we already got enough speed, man. We need jump ball. Claypool. That could be a little bit of a redemption. Canadian pulling at the heart string, 6'4", 238. But again, then it comes down to get that tight end. That tight end is like, if we bring in Claypool, we get that tight end, Trey McBride, maybe we have too much of the big power receiver type role. Hmm. Okay. Interesting to think about the wide receiver room here a little bit. I think, hmm. I think I do like Claypool here. What kind of how many years is he looking for? Chase Claypool looking for three years. How about two years? I will start that. Two years. And where does that bring us? Reasonable. I said I want to bring in some tight ends, fill out the depth there a little bit. Love my tight ends here. Um, but I not not day one. Not day one of active of active free agency. I think we can wait and see how the market kind of sets itself here. I'm interested. Someone like a Harrison Bryant, former Mackey winner, which went to the best tight end in college football. Couldn't really catch on with the Cleveland Browns a little bit. You got Albert O, who's a great athlete. We got Donald Parham, who's played some great football for us on this channel over the years. So we'll see kind of how the tight end market shapes up into stage two and three of free agency. I think left tackle, we'll wait a little bit later and we'll try to bring back Jake Witt. Left guard, Damian Lewis. That's an interesting name. You don't usually see... A lot of dev trait guards hitting over market. There's no interest there. Josh Jones, who we traded to the Texans, just didn't get re-signed at all. Could bring him back, honestly. But, I mean, we're good at left guard. 
Kevin Dodson. We got John Gaines. We have at center, Froholtz, currently our starter. If we could get younger, we got Lloyd Cushenberry, 26 years old. Had a dev trait last year, back on a normal. I'm not saying I'm against potentially upgrading here at center a little bit. Look at that guy. Look at that. I want that. that, that that's the look of how I want all my linemen to be. Mullet, mustache. That's pretty B.A. We got, we got Will Clapp. Will Clapp, the meme himself. Not stage one of free agency, but we'll probably add a center here. So add some competition. It's a solid guard free agency pool. At left guard, you get Damian Lewis with the dev trade. You got Jones, 27. Muti has some upside. At right guard, you got John Runyon, Cesar Ruiz, who has a dev trade. Unfortunately, that's one of the only positions on the offense I, I don't think we need to make a move. Either we have guys that are solid enough starters, or we have starters that are too expensive to move on from. So even though you're pulling a little bit at my Eagles heartstrings here with John Runyon, you know, I, I, I don't really think that's the case. And at right tackle, I want to try and target someone that has a mentorship tag so they can get the additional XP for Paris Johnson. But that is going to be something that you get on, you know, the last stage here at Free Agency. You're not going to use up one of your five bids here on day one, but I definitely want to see if we can find a mentorship tag player to help out Paris Johnson. All right, what is this playbook? I think we got to draw our line of standing. The, the Dennis Allen, John Fox playbook is a 3-4. Base 3-4 scheme. We're going to make that move here before we start previewing the defense to see what we got. Let's shuffle everybody around and what would this Cardinals team look like now in a base 4-3? Where do we need to spend our money? We also make sure we align Ben Johnson's playbook with the scheme. So we are now going to be a vertical power run scheme. When switching schemes, really, it's just going to be the front seven. That is going to have to change up a little bit. So we have Ojolari and Perkins here, D-end, right end. We got Boogie Basham, Cameron Thomas, and Dimakeji just released stills. Too much depth and freed up almost another million bucks. Only one D-tackle on the roster in Kinlaw. So for free agency, you know, I, I think, you know, we traded for Boogie Basham. We're probably good at defensive end as it stands. And Cameron Thomas actually got a huge jump. He's like a 68 Outside linebacker jumps up to a 74 defensive end. So he might be one to watch. He'll be that could be a battle there in the preseason for some playing time. Definitely need to look at D tackle. I think on the open market, we're not going to be able to just straight up draft all of our depth behind Javon Kinlaw. So we will see how that market kind of sets. The linebacker core looks solid. Zabin Collins and Laketa at left outside linebacker in the inside. We have Papo and Moses. And on the outside, we got Kaiser White and Dennis Gardek. So I think as it stands, I feel pretty good with those linebackers. At least in terms of like not spending in free agency, but I do want to add some depth there at defensive tackle. I do want to look at a corner or two and maybe competition with Keith at safety. What are the defensive ends that are available? If there was like a big time upgrade, maybe we'd splurge a little bit. We got James Houston, star dev, only 25 years old, but you know, he's not getting on the field as it stands with our squad. Someone like Jerry Tillery might be able to move him back inside at D tackle, uh, but not really much there. Right defensive end. Again, we've been looking more so for like three, four DNs that can cook it, kick inside. Dorrance Armstrong has a dev trade at 27 years old. John Grenard tugging at my gator heartstrings there. Colin Furl, if we want to take another swing at like a redemption story. But again, not, not, not a lot of needle movers. But inside of D tackle, this is where I would be willing definitely to spend some money if the right name popped up. Why is Eric Armstead that low? He must have regressed hard. Got Michael Pierce, straight up nose tackle. Not really a scheme fit anymore. Looking for someone that has a little bit of upside. Getting lots of veterans here. Uh, Raekwon Davis, 27 years old. Does also kind of like fill that nose tackle role. Not necessarily what we want. Foe too. We could, I mean, how's, how's the guys that we like letting walks? Like maybe the most appealing players that are available. This is uh, not a good look. And maybe puts a little bit of pressure on us to look at D-tackle in the draft i think just to throw a line out there maybe raekwon davis we'll see two-year deal raekwon davis oh it's not good though that's not good that's not a good market at all what are the linebackers you got to be better than what we already have you gotta be better than zavin collins owen papo or kaiser white yeah frankie luvu who's like you know kind of a pass right kind of quasimodo there of, of a linebacker and rest of the passer also can play like more traditional linebacker, off-ball linebacker, but no interest meter there whatsoever. Uh, Daryl Taylor, more of a pass rushing depth. We have the veteran and Bobby Wagner, but look at this. Just, even if we want a linebacker, no one wants to come to Arizona. Devin White, Josie Jewell, Patrick Queen, Jordan Brooks, all some of the better players that are available right now 
with their Kenneth Murray. Throw another one in there. Maybe is he is he buddies with Kyler? I wonder if they would have been at Oklahoma together. Hmm. Because you could get like a Kenneth Murray, and then we release Kaiser White. But then there's that linebacker, like you know, we got some linebacker in the draft that I that I'm definitely kind of keying in on here a little bit. Gross Matos, more of a pass rusher. He could be a guy that could come in. We saw him last year in the Panthers series. He might be one of those guys, much like Thomas. We kick him down to defensive end. That rating goes up to a 76, 77, somewhere in that range. But no interest whatsoever in joining the team. So I, I appreciate his honesty right out the gate that we are going to have to severely overpay if we want to bring him in. So overall, linebackers, much like the defensive tackles, not much there. Look at the corners. It's just, that's the state of Madden 24, man. Free agency it's not bullish it's definitely not bullish and i think that drafting well is the the path to the best success for corners i mean we obviously kenny hodges is a favorite right now for the number one pick for us to draft which would be you know we pair that marco wilson did more than enough with five interceptions three pick sixes and garrett williams in the slot so we kind of have our three starters if we decide to go corner with one of our first round picks and corner has a lot of depth we've seen in the draft that Makes it so he's, you know you don't have to spend for the sake of spending. Now, I did like the look of this. C.J. Henderson played some good football for us last year. And I think at worst, whatever his contract's going to cost to be corner four, I think that's solid depth to have. So I, I want to keep C.J. Henderson in our world here. He was here in Madden 23. We'll see if we can bring him in here. Madden 24. And with that, we're getting, we're getting a reasonable offer here. Now, safety. Free and or strong, we are looking for competition with Keith Taylor. He's, what, below a 70 overall? So, like, if you're above a 70 and it makes sense, absolutely look at bringing him. We've got Geno Stone here, formerly of the Ravens, 25-73. Kevon Wallace, Blair, Terrell Burgess. Not a lot of not a lot of needle movers there, unless we want to go straight. we got the veteran. we got J. Ron, Chris Grant, Delpit. Hmm. Grant Delpit could be interesting. Has a dev trait. Was big time coming out of LSU. And I'm not someone like, you know, Keith's on the roster. Keith's the team captain. Doesn't need to be playing every single week. Doesn't need to be starting every single week to put it nicely. So I, I think Grant Delpit, there's someone six foot three. Has a dev trait. Can I get a better look at his player card here? 25 years old. Fits the profile. 88 speed, 91 acceleration, 86 awareness, 85 hit power. Decent coverage across the board. Decent catching. Now, we this is probably the guy we have to pay a little bit more for. There's already a bid. So we look in four-year. Hmm. It's a lot of money to try to replace Keith Taylor. Where would this put us? Who else is trying to? Right? Oh, it's Philly. So that must be doing something right. The Eagles are looking up. Howie Roseman has identified Grant Delpit as an upgrade. Then us being on the same page as the best general manager in the NFL uh, is is a good sign. And lastly, special teams. Matt Prater retired. We didn't sign resign Matt Ariza. Now we have scouted some special teamers. TJ Klein was the best looking kicker. He has A kick accuracy, A awareness. However, the kick power is only solid. So he's going to be a guy probably pretty good. Probably better than, you know, spending money on a kicker. If we were going to go to kicker, I'd get the guy that made that Richmond, Richman, Richmond song. Joey Sly, 98 kick power out here, but no interest in bringing him. So I think we'll probably draft our kicker. And then Punter are trying to pull on my heartstrings here with an awesome Florida Gator. Tommy Townsend was him and his brother. Awesome punters here. No interest, but I mean, outstanding punter. 83 overall. We can also look at bringing in Bill Burr. Our two punters that we identified during the draft process. We have Jonathan McQueen, who has B kick accuracy, elite kick. That, that guy's going to be probably our punter. Elite kick power. Oh, you got Tommy Alexander, who has A kick accuracy. What is your kick power? So, I mean, both these guys probably decent prospects. So this is as long as I'll spend on talking about special teamers. I think we'll go during the draft. Get these guys late. So to max out our active negotiations here during stage one, we'll throw an offer at Alberto because I really do want to address our tight end depth here. Even if we go after that tight end in the first round, we still are going to need four deep at that position. So our initial wave of free agency... We got Alberto, depth tight end. We have Raekwon Davis, depth defensive tackle. Could potentially start, I guess, if the draft doesn't turn out well. CJ Henderson, who could end up being corner four. 
Claypool, who's just at this point really be a depth wide receiver with some upside, offers a different skill set than what we are currently lacking in that room. And Grant Delpit is really the only starter that is uh, is on our board right now. So we have a new starter. I mean, hey, hey, I don't know if it's fair to call him a starter. He's got to go to an absolute war with Keith Taylor this offseason to see who can come out on top. But optimistic that the cream will rise to the top there. And nothing but death boost. And that's just, you know, we've done enough rebuilds to know that, like, free agency is not popping like it was in Madden 23. And when it does pop, you're going to want to have that money to spend if there's that rare splash move. I think being a little conscientious here of our salary cap is going to help us maybe next year if there's a absolute big fish that we need to sign. We'll have that money because we're not just spending for the sake of spending here this first offseason. In the next stage, I do want to look at bring back Jake Witt, Dan Feeney. I don't know why. That guy looks like a player that we need. And Riley Reef has the mentorship tag at right tackle to help out Paris Johnson. But with these offers, I'm not expecting them to sign. It's probably going to be a little bit of a process, probably going to day three. But there's no other bids flying in. And we are able to land a, you know, it could be fool's goal. Because clearly, didn't work out with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And they thought, well, maybe he'll finally pan out for us. Gets traded to the Bears. Same idea. Maybe Claypool will pan out for us. And by him hitting free agency, I assume, still has yet to pan out. What is the odds? Third time's a chairman. We have what, you know, let's hope Ben Johnson, worth his weight in gold on the offensive side of the ball, will finally be able to tap into the raw tools that Claypool has for him to be a weapon and asset for us. Had to be all over the place, but just because this is going to be our last time to look at the retirements, just understanding maybe how the league has changed. Pete Carroll's retired for the Seahawks in the NFC East. End of an era, Jason Kelsey and Brandon Graham hanging them up. Nanami can sue. Best defensive tackle I've ever seen play the game of college football. Also, shout out Calais Campbell. Mercedes Lewis, after 18 years, holy, uh, in the AFC. Kareem Jackson's played some pretty good football. Dwayne Brown retires. Von Miller has retired. That's a surprise. I thought he'd play a lot longer. He had a huge year, like 17, 18 sacks last season. Uh, Pat Pete, Cardinal legend, has hung up. Same as Cam Hayward, the great Trevor Simeon. Okay, some big names. At the end of day two of free agency, I, I don't really need to pivot too, too much. So we're still going to stay here with our two offers, Rafini and Witt. They're going to draw this one out into day three. Look at where some of the bigger names have signed. Austin Eckler taking his talents to the Chicago Bears. Him and Justin Fields in the same backfield. Mike Williams to the Houston Texans as well as Stephon Gilmore. Bobby Wagner out of our division going to the Titans. Micah High to the Eagles. Adrian Amos to the Lions. Interesting. So, I mean, again, just because it wasn't a crazy free agency period. Uh, the Vikings spending a lot here at linebacker. Devin White, Josie Jewell, DPJ going to the Texans. So big time spenders there. A.J. Dillon joining Lamar Jackson in the Baltimore Ravens backfield. Kirk Cousins is going to be the Rams quarterback. Okay. John Ronnie to the Titans. So, man, the Titans, the Texans, the Vikings, and Bears. Really the big spenders of this first free agency period. Now that free agency is pretty much down to just depth, guys. It's time to shift all of our attention towards the draft. The combine and pro days have come and gone. Let's go through. We have some big names that we want to definitely follow up on, but we'll go position by position, and I'll kind of highlight guys that I am targeting. So for the quarterbacks, King and Stoutmeyer, we're not going to be investing a top five pick at the quarterback position. So we're going to be more so looking for someone that can come in and compete with Kyler Murray and Clayton Toon for that quarterback three spot. We have Eric Holcomb who has elite throw power, and Larry Clemens, who has also elite throw power, but don't really have the mobility that I think, especially given the state of our team right now, that probably would require for our offense. You know, I, I think there has to be some level of mobility, and we're not really getting with those two guys, but I think a quarterback that could be interesting, day three, Jerome Bush out of Texas. Don't have much in terms of key ratings, but the athletic profile looks pretty good. Great acceleration, good speed, elite throw power, and if he's going to be there, say 6th round, 7th round, runs a 4-6-1, that elite throw power, got a cannon, could be somewhere in the area code, 94, 95. I think that's that's pretty decent for a QB3. For the running back room, we feel good. Michael Carter and Corey Clement. And we got James Conner. After going through all the running backs, definitely found one that I, I do think I might even want to overdraft a little bit. And that is Roosevelt Bonds. He has A carrying, which is, it stands out amongst the other fast running backs. Great acceleration, good speed. Ran a 4-3-6 at his pro day. Put up the second highest bench press, so he has good strength. He is a power back archetype. Three cone and 20 yard shuttle. Nothing spectacular, but for a guy, especially if he's there late round three, going into round four. 
power back, which is kind of the that's the scheme fit for our scheme. And really, Corey Clement and Michael Kyder don't really fit that power back archetype. I definitely think there's some value here. Big time name here, one to watch: Roosevelt Bonds. So fullbacks, our fullbacks. This is your classic round seven. There's nothing left. We got Pete Con here out of Oklahoma, six one, almost two sixty. Key ratings aren't the best, but if you're looking for an athlete, we got elite acceleration, agility, and speed to go along with great strength. I don't know how many drug tests he'll pass, but he could he could make the roster. The wide receivers, I'm glad we feel pretty good about our wide receiver room because it I haven't seen so many Fs and Ds for player grades. I mean, the best of the bunch, we had John Cook as a player we talked about earlier just because he has B catch and B release as a deep threat, but not really overly prolific outside of elite acceleration. I think another wide receiver, we have D'Angelo Hamlin, who is A, double B, and a C at 6'2", 230. 230 running a 439 is pretty impressive, but the three cone and 20 yard shuttle, not exactly what you want, and it doesn't scream first round wide receiver. So my short list is, you know, late, real late guys. We have Patrick Knight and UDFA at a Youngstown State, 6'2", with 224, B release, B catch in traffic, 448 in the 40, but... Again, that's kind of just a role player. And if we want to bring an athlete day three at a William Mary, we have Juan Wilder, five foot nine, and he is the best athlete in this class at the wide receiver spot. Elite acceleration, great speed, four three six, and he's almost top five, top five for sure at his pro day in the three cone and twenty yard shuttle. But I don't think we're going to be reaching for any wide receiver this year. The offensive line is tough to really get a lot of information for linemen without scouting them heavily. Uh, Devion Durant out of Penn State. A impact blocking. Don't have a lot of information, but the athletic profile is outstanding. And a 479 put up 34 reps on the bench press. He might very well be like the top tackle overall. Even though we've been getting mocked Curtis White out of Notre Dame, who has double A, B plus block, really hinging on how well that run blocking grade ends up being for us to, you know, because at this point we'd be drafting someone to replace DJ Humphreys, who's already. Too expensive to move on from and still solid, all things considered. But White does look like a pretty good player. Great acceleration, elite speed. First in the bench press at the combine. So he was all jacked up, standing out amongst his peers on that day. But I just really don't think we're going to be going early for an offensive tackle. Uh, we definitely could look at adding a swing tackle late, especially depending if Jake Witt doesn't sign or not. We have Dave Russell here who has B run blocking, athletically speaking, elite agility, pretty good athlete. Uh, 34 reps at his pro day. Or we have Antoine Owens, who has B awareness, B run blocking, projected UDFA out of Colorado, one of Dion's kids. Elite agility, great speed. Could be a little stronger, but looks could be something there. A little bit open, more open-minded to go on the interior, potentially, at left guard. We have Waters, Bacon, and Norton. Uh, Waters, second, third round. We have B run blocking, but the physicals look pretty good. Elite change of direction and agility. Uh, big time athlete for that position. Also love the fact he put up 38 at his pro day. Kevin Bacon, Moen's name, strongest guard in the class. 38 reps at his pro day to go along with top five pretty much in every testing. And for a UDFA, absolutely worth kicking the tires. Shaq Norton here, outstanding pass protector. A awareness, A pass blocking, third, fourth round. So there could be some value there on the board. Elite change of direction. Maybe not the power that you really want to look for. The reason why we bring that up, you're lacking the power a little bit. We are looking for center competition. I think we could upgrade the center spot where our two guards seem to be at least set for this year with Will Hernandez and Dotson. I think someone like Shaq Norton could easily slide into center and utilize that pass blocking. We have two centers though. We have no right guards. Just I'm not ignoring that in case I don't skip over it. We have Nick Street, first rounder. This would be more with like the Houston Texans pick that we have later on. A impact blocking, B pass block, and uh, pretty big time athlete. Elite acceleration, change of direction, and speed. Decent reps on the bench press. This guy here is your, you know, we talk about regens, right? Jason Kelsey just retired. This is could be the Jason Kelsey regen in the draft class. And that's why the Eagles are a top fit, worst secondary fit. I, I could get a center late first round. I have a little bit later, Julian Jacobson. No idea of the key ratings. Kind of more so going off the athletic profile where he's pretty much top five in every single testing. But I do think if we want to address the center spot, if we want to get... More on the expensive end, Nick Street could be in play late first. But again, with, you know, Shaq Norton here, if he's there, third, fourth round, double A, slide him into center. Could be some value there with a position change. But the man we all want to see on the offensive side of the ball, we have Deontay Armstrong. Great looking player, by the way. 
Another first round tight end, 6'6", out of Oklahoma, A catching, A run blocking, ran a 4'6'4", has elite acceleration, elite jumping. But the man that made us even double take our new superstar tight end in Trey McBride, who broke out for 1,000 yards, Marcus House out of Louisville. Three A's, catching, deep front running, and run blocking. We don't know it's catching traffic, but at 6'4", 259, Marcus House went off at the combine. We got elite in acceleration, agility, change of direction, jumping, and speed, getting great in strength. So one, one blow, elite. 4-5-1, ran a 4-4-9 at his pro day. 35-inch vert, first in the three-cone drill, first in the 20-yard shuttle. This could be generational. Could be generational. And I'm thinking about it, you know, in today's NFL, you don't, you know, do we really consider Travis Kelsey a tight end or would you just, do we just group him in as a receiver? Like his tight end becoming less of like, well, you got to block and you can catch at tight end. You are a receiver. Travis Kelsey is as valuable as a Cooper Cup, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson for what he can do to the offense. And if we just remove the tight end tag and kind of view Marcus House, like how the Atlanta Falcons probably viewed Kyle Pitts in their war room. Like he's not a tight end. This is a receiver. This is the best receiver in the draft class, especially for how shit the wide receiver draft looking like right now. So definitely have a decision to make. Now on the defensive side of the ball, definitely a strength of this class, I do think, is when you get more towards the secondary. As far as the front seven is concerned, I'm pretty happy that we are content with our front seven, maybe outside of defensive tackle. Matthew Randall here is a late first rounder. This would be something that we would consider potentially with that Houston Texans pick. Pretty good athlete, top five in the 40-yard dash, uh, and just outside that in the three-cone, the 20-yard shuttle. Has great strength, great speed, great acceleration, and, I mean, you know, you get double Bs there on the power move and tackle. Not someone that you're going to necessarily trade up to get, but I think if he falls to us, there, there could be something there. We have Zach Gross, if we want to look a little bit later on, third, fourth round projection, 6'2", 257 speed rusher out of Penn State, and we've seen with the Micah Parsons, the OAs of the world, Penn State, Produce big time athletes, and we get a little bit of that with Zach Gross, who is top 10 in the 40, best in the vertical. Three cone and 20 yard shuttle are very nice. It's elite jumping, elite acceleration, but at this point in time, I'm not seeing a, at least a defensive end, classified as a defensive end, uh, that I want to rush to. I think if we do want to go pass rush, and it's probably going sooner than later. This would be a scenario if we decide we want to trade down. Shaq Bright out of Ohio State could be the pass rusher to get this year. We have A pursuit, B tackle, and athletically speaking, pretty good. Ran a 4.57 at his pro day. Top 10 in the three cone and 20 yard shuttle. Good strength, great speed. But is this a guy that you want to draft in the top 10? This is a guy that like, if he could follow you outside of the top 10, we could start talking about, you know, that pick 15 range, maybe moving up a little bit from that Houston Texans selection. Uh, Shaq Bright could come in and offer us something on the other side of B. J. Larry, if that's if that's where we want to go. But I do feel like when we want to swing early for a pass rusher, we want to get a guy that's at least flirting with generational status. And unfortunately, one of those just doesn't exist here in this draft. Slight value, Brandon Jones is a speed rusher, right outside linebacker, three Bs across, but he's undersized at 6'3", 241. I don't know, he's probably treading the line between like a off ball linebacker and a pass rusher. And maybe his archetype just bumps him into the rusher. But you know, he did ran a 4 5 8. Athletically speaking, his pro day top 10 in the three cone and 20 yard shuttle has great speed as a skill set, but very slim pickings for pass rushers this year. Oh, here linebackers, off ball linebackers, not a crazy need for us. I think Owen Popo has very, very high ceiling. I, I think I'm very optimistic about what Owen Popo could potentially be, develop, bring to our, our team as, as a big time playmaker. Therefore, some of these guys that are going early, I, I don't think linebacker is a position that we need to reach for. We got some great athletes here. Hitchens is a great athlete. We have Gabe Barnett, a little bit more value, big time athlete. Devin Logan, first rounder out of Notre Dame, A pursuit, B tackle, and he cost you a first rounder. He's a 4 3 7, which is one of the fastest times I've seen a linebacker have. He posts his elite strength straight up. Uh, we got Martin Red. If you want to go for a little bit more of a value, third, fourth rounder. That is a big time athlete. Four, four, five at his pro day. Top five in the three cone, almost twenty yard shuttle. UDFA Morris Rush. I think this is where the value is going to come for us, though, because we're looking for a linebacker that can compete with Kaiser White. 
He's kind of the odd man out right now. Still solid, not rushing to replace him, but he is a little bit expensive. If you sign him as a free agent uh, from the Philadelphia Eagles, he's one of Jonathan Gannon's guys. So is he going to fit in our defense? I do think there might be more value as opposed to getting a first rounder that we're drafting based off of his athletic ability. When you get someone like Morris Rush, UDFA, that's a big time athlete. On the other side, uh, we have some, you know, not first round talent. Keegan Torrance has A zone coverage, B pursuit out of Penn State, legit athlete, has elite jumping, change of direction, and acceleration, great three cone and 20 yard dash. Taj Jowers, UDFA pool, B tackles, all we really know, but if we want to draft an athlete that has a shot, and like Owen Papa, where like you're getting him for special teams and athletic ability, maybe he can develop into more. Jowers here could fit that bill. Elite acceleration and speed, ran a 4 5 2. The three cone and 20 yard shot will look great. Uh, Kennedy from LSU. A little bit more expensive, probably likely out of our price range. But if we are going to be in the market for competition for Kaiser White, this is a guy that we've been talking about as we've highlighted the draft class uh, throughout the season. Trent Lindsay out of Arizona State has A pursuit, A zone coverage, and the physicals look real nice. I mean, it's always tough getting these outside linebackers because they get compared and all these rankings go up against edge rushers. But Lindsay has elite acceleration and speed. Ran a 4.56 at his pro day. The three cone and 20 yard shuttle meet all the parameters that we're looking for. And I think if we, and that's about the price range. I think I would want to spend to add competition to our linebacking room. Because even if we do get Lindsey and he beats out Kaiser White or competes with Kaiser White, we're still going to be running a lot of nickel. And that's going to be Owen Popo and Zayvon Collins. But I do think there is a lot of value here in Trent Lindsey. And he's definitely one to watch for the draft. Especially, maybe not so much in the second round, but if he falls to the third round where we're going to have High picks, we have a lot of picks in second, third, fourth, and fifth round. Lindsay could be great value for us. We need defensive tackle help, and I think it's pretty good looking class. All things considered, I have a couple value picks here a little bit later on. We did do a lot of scouting on Amari Alexander. This was more so when we were in a 3-4 base at 6-4, 296. Likely would be a defensive end. I'm not saying I would not get him, because if you're worried about him being sub 300 pounds, holding him in the run game, I mean, he's powerful. 39 reps on the bench press. All of his athletic attributes look nice. And if we're staying put with that Houston Texans pick late first rounder, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't completely rule it out. Uh, but I do think the big two that we want to focus on at D-Tackle, one is Warmack, a day three pick. So I think in terms of value, he's one of, you know, we know these types. 6'4", 360, B block said, C finesse move, B tackle. He put up 43 reps at the combine for his bench press. You know, that's what he's going to get. We're not going to get much of an interior pass rush, but for run stuffers, which we need help right now. Javon Kinlaw, we have seen he can rush the passer for us. Someone like Warmack, day three, probably one of the best day three players. But my favorite defensive tackle might be Alex Jones. He is a animal-human hybrid, okay? Maybe a little bit out there in terms of conspiracy and, and all that different stuff. But out of Clemson, big-time football player, six foot one. 340 pounds, B block said, double C's, A tackle, put up 46 reps at the combine, almost breaking the record. Like this guy here is, is you know, he's some sort, he's part bull. Part bull, part football player, and I think he will be one of our top targets. And honestly, when all is said and done, if we can find a way to get Jones and Warmack, I, I think that is outstanding depth for our defensive line in case there's ever injuries like that. So if we can get something like Alex Jones in the third round, get Warmack fourth, fifth round, somewhere there in day three, that might be a great role at D-Tackle, and I won't rule out someone like Amari Alexander. Starting the secondary with the safeties, a little less important than the corner, so that's going to be the big one. As it stands at safety, Jalen Thompson was one of the top tacklers in the NFL and our Buda Baker successor for the leader of that secondary. Grant Delpit, along with Keith Taylor at strong safety, I think that that's probably the direction we're going. There's still some solid safeties in this class, Dante Baker, first rounder out of Ohio State, eight hit power, B man, B tackle. Combine, not too shabby, top five, 40 yard dash, three cone, and 20 yard shuttle. Gordon Fox, another first rounder out of LSU, A hit power, A tackle, C zone. Athletic speaking, was the fastest safety at the combine, 446. But like, that's, that's expensive. All the free safeties that look legit, they're going to be expensive. And I just don't think that's going to be worth the investment now. A little bit later on, we got J.J. Rutledge, who we've done our scouting on. Eight hit power, eight tackle. I think this guy could be great special team right away. Also, I mean, four five five at his pro day is plenty fast enough. We have day three, Jimmy Ross out of Las Vegas. 
who's also pretty good athletically speaking. 454, the three cone and 20 yard shadow look nice. We have a UDFA here in Chris Briscoe out of Wisconsin, who we're more so would also be drafting on his athletic ability. But I, I think that's probably the range we'd be talking about safeties. Corner, however, I mean, it's. We got guys, man. We've done our scouting. This was the one position that we really focused on. We got to find another corner that could come in and start on the outside. Marco Wilson, five picks, three pick sixes. Garrett Wilson, Garrett Williams in the slot is nice, but we want to throw some additional playmakers out there and see what sticks. Luke Rowland is a UDFA that we scouted as a third, fourth rounder. Dion Francois, day three pick. That is a second, third round talent. Double B in man and press. C zone covers not too bad. Athletically speaking, four three eight at his pro day. So uh, that is a guy that we will definitely consider in day three. Uh, same with Justin Langford, A catching, B man, B press. There is some value there. But corners, not necessarily a position that I want to wait for value. I, I think if we can go out and invest immediately, it is going to be worthwhile. And we have three first round corners that are deserving of that selection. Second, the first two guys we're going to talk about, more so maybe that Houston Texan pick. We have Thaddeus Compton out of Mississippi State, B catching, B press, B zone, six feet tall. And he is the speedster. Even though he only has great speed, he ran a 4-2-8 at his pro day. Uh, the three-cone and 20-yard shuttle just breaking in that top 10 threshold that you like to see. Khalil Davis out of Notre Dame, 6 foot 3 with B-catching, 8-man, B-press, B-zone. Looks like a monster. He has elite agility, great speed, running a 4-3-9 at his pro day. Bench press is great. Three-cone and 20-yard shuttle is even better. And I think this would be a guy that if somehow he is slipping down there to the tail end, of the first round, it'd be nice, but I think he'll be gone soon. But the big man right now, it's either House or Kenny Hodges, six foot three, 184 pounds. Be catching a man, B press, A zone. A man in A zone is an unreal role. He's fully scouted as a top five talent. And the whole process where it's been like, do we go Hodges? Do we go House at tight end? It was because Hodges didn't look like you know an incredible athlete. He looked like he was solid athlete. You know, looking at the side there. But look, great acceleration, great agility, elite change of direction, great jumping, great speed. He might not be S tier, but 437, I bet you if you've been paying attention to this draft, 437 is probably faster than you thought he was going to run. The bench press is solid, 38 inch vert, 38 and a half, top five in the three cone and 20 yard shuttle. Kenny Hodges might just be him. An outstanding scouting report from in house. Garrett Williams and him were teammates at Syracuse. He said, that guy there. Looks every bit a top five true talent. So the character checks out and we could have a little bit of reuniting the Syracuse Orange in our secondary if that is truly where we want to go. I hate that it is going to be such a tough call. The more we watched and studied Kenny Hodges, he's been the guy that's kind of been the front runner all along. And especially with the emergence of Trey McBride at tight end, it's like, well, push comes to shove. If we don't get house, we still have a really good tight end. If we don't get Kenny Hodges. There's still clear questions about... You know, our entire secondary. Is this defense going to be able to take a new turn? Do we have the talent that this defense can take a new turn for John Fox? So, man, this is, it's, I hate that it's this tough because when you have the pressure of the first overall pick, you'd love it to be a lamp. You'd love it to be, there's one clear cut top prospect. And when you have Kenny Hodges, when you have House at tight end, you know, there's always going to be the regret that if you pull the trigger on Hodges and then we see House's X Factor 84 generational tight end, we're going to feel bummed out. Or if we go House and we overthink it, I don't want to say that overthinking means I'm leaning not going House, but it would kind of be because we're trying to assume that we'd be able to make it work with two tight ends or move one in the slot or move one to wide receiver, something like that. That might be overthinking it. And someone like Kenny Hodges that is just plug and play in the secondary should be the right pick all us up. I honestly don't know. I wish this was a live stream and we could just see everyone going crazy who we should go with because I don't know. Now, I'm not going to rule out the possibility of, you know, if we go one at one, trying to trade up to get both because clearly these are like the top two players in this year's draft class for us. And I would love to be able to find a way to get both of them. However, it would cost a lot because we'd have to jump up from pick 27. So... I can only imagine what that's going to cost. I mean, we could see where the fifth and final mock draft has, for example, House going. But if it is trading up into the top five, we do have a lot of picks, I suppose, if we really want to swing. How about this? Here'll be something that'll be fun. Whoever we get, if we can't up getting both of them, we're gonna we're gonna look under the hood. We're gonna see between Hodges and House who truly is the best player. Let me know in the comments right now what team are you on. 
Are you team Kenny Hodges? Are you team Marcus House? So whoever we go with, you could say you were right or ah man C4, you were wrong. Whatever you want to call it. What team are you on? Hodges or House? Let me know in the comments. We were able to finish up free agency getting our depth targets. Riley Reef, the mentor tag to work with. Paris Johnson. We got Dan Feeney, the mullet man himself, as depth center. And Jake Witt back as our developmental left tackle. All right, we are one week closer to the draft. I'm, I'm going to try to trade up. House is going. The tight end is going at the fifth pick. Like, this is pretty much how it actually would go. So if we got Hodges at one and one at House, we'd have to find a way to get the fifth. I would, I would package... Trey McBride, superstar dev tight end. I'd package our second first round pick and I'd honestly pay whatever the Lions who sit at five would want. Uh, obviously, they would probably rather house over McBride, even though McBride is young on a rookie contract with a superstar dev. You still get more years with House, who likely also has a dev trait. Um, but in case that trade doesn't go through, definitely want to tab up and get some more information on some other players here that could potentially go in the first round. I think... Hmm. So I'm not too worried about like the day two, day three picks or anything like that. I feel we can trust the scouting. It should, it should be the first round in case, you know, we can't make that trade and we are stuck at that pick. We gotta make sure we make the right call. I do wanna get a read on one of the D tackles here. Just because if it's close, we got to pick one. I'd like a little more information. So let's go with... Hmm. We'll go Alex Jones. Because he's a human animal hybrid. And then... Hmm. I would ju just say outside of that, I I let's see what Lindsay looks like. Just because he has the double A there. Maybe we get a little more information to maybe draft ahead of some of those other guys in that log jam round between the second, third, and fourth round where you have a bunch of picks. Whew, man, I'm I, I'm, just like, I'm nervous, and I think before I can even get too nervous, let's, let's make sure we can't get that pick to select both of them. But after we got our extra scouting, let's see if we got enough to at least confirm or deny that House is a top five. We did not get enough. Scouting to say for sure he's a lock for a top five talent, but let's be honest. I, I think the value here again is like you just you gotta throw out the fact that he is a tight end. He's a receiver. He is a receiver. I've seen I already posted the thing on Twitter trying to compare the two, and they're like, just moving to wide up. That guy's gonna be a dope wide receiver, which he very well might be. Um we got our D tackles here. And we didn't what? I didn't get any information on Jones. We got more information on Lindsay. We got B block shut up. Why didn't I get any more on the D tackle? It's kind of a ripoff. Human animal hybrid. You can't scout that anymore. All right. It's the draft. Let's let's call Detroit and just see. Just see what a potential trade could look like. So we called up the Detroit Lions and said, what do you want for pick five? They gave us three trade packages. One, not doing that at all. And then we got two that are involving draft picks. First scenario involves us sending our first round pick next year. Our first round pick in two years time, as well as our second round pick next year, a fifth this year, and a future seventh. So basically, the meat and potatoes is that two first round picks in this deal in future drafts. Or we could send them the Houston Texans pick at 27, two second round picks this year, two second round picks next year, and a seventh for a generational tight end. The question would be, what could I throw in this scenario? What could I, if I put McBride in, what could I take out? I, I definitely could give them, uh, let's, let's, let's see if they'll decide this one. I feel like McBride as a superstar dev tight end entering with two years left on his rookie contract. I could probably take out one of the seconds this year and one of the seconds next year. Is that, that, that'd be fair. All right, here's going to be my trade offer. Only thing I took out from what they wanted, I took out one of the 2025 second rounders. They originally wanted two 2025 second rounders. I took that out to try to overpay a little bit more by throwing in Trey McBride, 24 years old, two years left on his contract, superstar dev tight end, coming off a 1,000-yard season. Right? Pretty sure? 
Coming off 67 catches, 1,100 yards, 8 touchdowns. If they take this, I can sleep at night. If they don't take this, I I don't feel comfortable offering multiple first-round picks, given that we have Trey McBride in place for the next two seasons. Will they do it? They will! That is a gigantic trade. We gave more than what they wanted to make sure we went well and beyond. And that, I mean, let's go. Let's go. That decline, decline, decline. We finally got a trade over the line. It is time for the 2024 NFL Draft. And with the first overall pick, the Arizona Cardinals, out of the University of Syracuse, teammate of Garrett Williams, select Kenny Hodges, cornerback, Syracuse, hidden dev, 93 speed, 90 agility, 96 change of direction, 90 jumping, 94 speed, 93 excel. A awareness, A man coverage, A zone coverage, B catching, B press, C play rec, C hit power. What a stud that is the best corner player, corner prospect that has been in Arizona Cardinals since Patrick Peterson. Now we got to wait, make sure no one messes this up. Second pick goes Alex King, quarterback of Memphis. The Raiders at pick three select Johnny Stoutmeyer, quarterback. Cal at pick four. We feel pretty good. They got Kyle Pitts. We're trying to get the next Kyle Pitts. But the Atlanta Falcons at pick four select Shaq Bright, the edge rusher we were considering out of Ohio State. And after doing all the maneuvering, I think it's fair to say this guy is the fan favorite of the two picks between the corner and himself. And we paid a pretty penny. We gave up, and the, one of the seconds we gave up was pick 33. That's almost as good as a first rounder. Be worth it. If they, I think actually it would be the ultimate, like, just the ultimate if he ends up being just somehow like average, like 76 normal dev. But we're gonna think positively. Three A's, six four, 260, out of Louisville, elite acceleration, elite agility, elite change of direction, elite jumping, elite speed. Weapon, Marcus House, 80, oof, I thought he might be a little faster than that, 90 acceleration, 88 agility, 84 jumping, 87 speed, what do we got here, A awareness, A break tackle, A catching, A deep route running, A medium route running, A pass block, A run block, A short running, A spec catch, holy shit, <laughs> alright, just Pausing for a second here. We're now into the second round, getting an idea of who might fall to us once we start getting back into our hall of picks at the first selection of the third round. Looking at our board, Eric Holcomb, the quarter. I don't really think I want to target the quarterback. I'd say top targets going into our remaining picks. Alex Jones at defensive tackle. I think Trent Lindsay at outside linebacker. That's one and two. I think Roosevelt Bonds would probably fit just right into the top three that I would really want to try to target there. And then it would just be like adding more defensive tackle depth. Um, Shaq Norton also can kind of fit in that role. I, again, we, you know, shifting him inside the center potentially. So we, we do have a decent board as we uh, enter out the, you know, the final picks here of the second round. <sighs> Trent Lindsay, who I... I think it would be fair to say because we did that extra scouting was probably going to be the pick at one in the third round. Goes to Tampa Bay. We'll, we'll have to double double check after the draft, see just what we missed out on there. Luckily, the Chiefs didn't, you know, smash our pick. We got two picks coming up. Pick one and six in the third round. And I think we're going to have to go show love. I mean, could be Shaq Norton. A awareness, A pass block. Not a ridiculous athlete, though. And I wonder if he would still be there a little bit later on. We do have, look, pick 1, 6, 27, 28. And I would say I would be more than fine trying to package maybe a couple fifths to move up in the third round if they start to slip. Uh, to get off of, like, either 27 or 28. So I'm thinking our first pick here. I mean, he's the next heat tackle up. Human-animal hybrid. Pick one of the third round out of Clemson. B block shed, C finesse, C power, A tackle. Put up 46 reps 
on the bench press. Alex Jones, welcome to the Arizona Cardinals. I got pick six in the third round. None of our of our top targets went. We got Eric Holcomb at quarterback. In terms of like lowest available players. Got some linebackers here. Shaq Norton's still there. Okay, here's what we need to do. It's all it's kind of like the order. How far away is Bonds for the running backs? Like I feel like Bonds could be it's getting pretty close. And for guards, it's Shaq. I think we go Shaq Norton. And then I would let's gamble that if another running back goes, it would be either Whitaker or Combs. And then we can decide, like, all right, they're starting to go running backs. We can go grab Bonds. But at pick six, the project is slide into center. We are gonna go with Shaq Norton out of Texas AM and the dev. Oh, let's go. The dev trait streak is alive and well here in the Cardinals draft. All right. The Ravens just selected the top available running back. Let's call Seattle and see who they want for a pick. Because after Seattle is the Chargers who did just lose Austin Eckler in free agency. We were able to move up. Three and two fives this year. The jump, what I would imagine and envision to justify this trade, the Chargers for a running back. Do we need a running back? Probably not. I like our running back room. But this guy looks good. Roosevelt Bonds, A carrying. That's all I need to see. A carrying, 222 pounds. Power back, which is what we need. We need to get younger at power back. He could allow us in the future. You know, James Conner is going to get expensive. But that 436, that three cone, that vertical. That bench press, welcome to the Cardinals and another dev trade. Let's go. This is, this is insane. This couldn't have gone any better. We are now back on the clock at pick number 28. Let's take a look at our board here. Probably leaning Warmack as top available. Add just more depth to the defensive tackle room. Um... You know, Dion Francois could be a good value pick in our next because we have Skedder as a second, third round talent. Jerome Bush can still wait on that quarterback. A lot of linebackers. Another good thing is like a lot of these guys that we did find as sleepers, like UDF days. They're likely going to be there uh, with some of those fifth round picks that we have. So I think we're going to double dip on the defensive tackles. Going to bring in another just freaking monster. Jonathan Warmack, South Florida, 6'4", 360. We got B block shed. B tackle, somehow he's pulling a C finesse move. What finesse moves can this human being do at that size? Welcome. Oh, and there's the streak. Up dev traits is over, but still could be a really good player. And I mean, I'll take at 360, 71 acceleration. Ain't bad. And of course, you gotta you gotta be impressed. 96 strength. Powerhouse. The first pick of the fourth round, we're going to continue to help the secondary out here go with the best player we have scouted, and that is Dion Francois out of Michigan State, 6'3", 210, second, third round talent, still on the board, and that is hopefully some solid depth. We would have, would have loved a dev trait roll there, but let's be honest, we're, greedy. we're going to be very greedy at this point if we keep asking for more dev traits. We'll grab a linebacker here, best available, potentially, right? He has the A zone coverage, which is kind of drawing my attention i still think we need to pull the trigger on a special teamer and i think it's going to be likely a punter which i think was mcqueen right he had b kick actually elite power so that'll likely be our last pick which is coming up we have two picks remaining and i don't think we have to worry about the punter so now it's just where who where and who do we need to land assuming that a lot of these udfa guys aren't going to slip through the cracks I think probably linebacker, Taj Jowers, B-tackle, great athlete. But I have been burned by great athletes before in the past. We have Jerome Bush. We've talked about his potential backup quarterback. Uh, great athlete, elite throw power. He won't slip through the cracks. He won't be available. We have Brandon Jones, day three pick. Three Bs. He's a speed rusher. Really, we actually would wonder what that zone coverage is. Um, ah, screw it. We'll go Max. We'll go Max Wade. Okay. Wet fart. A little bit of a womp womp. And with our final pick, 
for now. There's a chance I might just get bored and want to trade back up and get, you know, a sixth, seventh round pick. Uh, we're going to go Jonathan McQueen, punter. We need a punter. Punt God didn't really work out for us. This guy, B accuracy, C awareness, but has that elite kick power. Whew. Okay, looks good. All right, I said a future sixth to the Browns to get back into the seventh round this season. Draft board is, is getting pretty light, but a player that we scouted fairly early on in the process, still on the board. I, I would say that Rush and Jack, I want one of these one of these linebackers, which I think I'll probably trade back up again. I don't know who I could who I could trade, but we have JJ Rutledge who looks awesome. We have a kicker, future kicker. I think we got to get the kicker here. But I also want okay. We go Rutledge kicker and one of those linebackers. I'm gonna try three times to trade back up, but Rutledge, who we scouted early on the double A's, I knew that this would be worth it. I love it. Hidden depth. This is an overpay, but I don't care. We're able to get both picks into the seventh round to try to get our linebacker and kicker. So I sent a fifth in two years' time, which I'm sure in two years' time, I'm be like, where the hell is my fifth round pick? But hopefully by that point, we have a Super Bowl and the two players that we are trading up for develop into monsters. So first, we're going to grab TJ Klein, kicker out of Penn State. Hit it, <laughs> kicker, baby. Woo! You son of a... Titans, I mean, the Titans might have just made it easier because it was going to come down to two linebackers. They took the one I was leaning more towards, but that's fine. Not everything is going to be able to get a perfect roll. I mean, Luke Rowland, that's going to be a guy that hopefully slips through the cracks, will come up and hit him back as a UDFA. Honestly, all these guys could very well be UDFA targets for us, but we are going to get Taj Jowers, the very, very athletic linebacker here at Texas Tech. We got B-Tackle. Ran a 4-5-2, first in the three-cone, 20-yard shuttle, elite speed, elite acceleration. Reminds me a little bit of Owen Popo. Maybe we'll be able to follow in his shoes. Similar success story. Welcome to the Cardinals. Psych! Rowland got drafted. Here's a very quick look. This honestly is just for me. The, the last pick in the draft's coming up. So these, Connor, Russell, Bacon, Knight, and Briscoe, those are going to be the guys we're going to run to see if we can sign them as UDFAs. Okay. Let's see it. Draft recap time. I'm going to close my eyes so you guys can see it before I do. I, we got a lot. Of, it was a great draft. Should be. We tanked. But what do we got? Please be good. Please just assume that my reaction is going to be amazing and not I'm looking at two guys. Honestly, I need one to be an 80+. plus. Dev traits are probably going to be fairly solid. I'm optimistic we didn't just draft two star dev players. I would love for them both to be over 80. That would mean the most to our team. But if I can at least get one over 80, I'll be like, you know what? That's not bad. I'll be happy with that. On top of all the dev, uh, all the other dev traits that we got. Look at that draft. Holy shit, look at that draft. Oh, okay, Jowers kind of suck. They're definitely not worth trade up for Jowers. But holy. Kenny Hodges, 81. Hidden dev, 82 with the boost. Oh, that that plus three sprint speed that we already got on the on the coaching tree there. 82 man, 82 zone, 70 plot, 70 play rack, 71 catching. Awesome. Marcus House. 80 vert threat. 87 speed, 87 catching, 90 acceleration, decent route running. I, I would say for the he had a block. I thought his block might be a little better. But let's be honest, not going to require him to, to run block a whole lot. That is, that'll do. Alex Jones, human-animal hybrid, 75 hidden dev, 97 strength, 82 tackle, 71 acceleration. Pretty beastly. Nose tackle, gigantic. We have Shaq Norton. Now, I'm just going to move right now. He's not going to play guard pressing. We drafted him. With the intention of cross-training him as a center. So he goes from a 74 guard to a 73 center. Still fine. Still an upgrade for us. 83 strength. 82 pass block. 84 impact blocking. Pretty solid. Pretty solid. We got Bonts. Wanted him. 75 hidden dev running back at a Utah State. As soon as I saw that he was a power back that ran a 4-3, I was in. And look at the stats. 91 speed, 93 acceleration, 92 carry, 72 catching for a power back. 
as much as we love Corey Clement, as much as we were impressed by Michael Carter, they are on watch because Roosevelt Bonds is not going to want to wait too long to try and become RB1. Warmack was the end of the dev traits. But 70, still not bad. You know, that's that's the big threshold. You get anyone over a 70, usually that's a pretty good, especially going into, you know, day three, 96 strength. Clearly the highlight of him. Uh, Francois, 71 corner. We got Max, the linebackers kind of, kind of scary. I mean, again, I, I said literally when I made the pick, I've got robbed a little bit this year in Madden 24 with the athletic linebackers not having the best ratings. So Wade, definitely not a great pick. Low light, even in the fifth round, 62 is kind of low for me. Uh, McQueen, our punter, 73. We got Rutledge, the late hidden dev safety that we traded back up for. Scouted him early. He was one of the first guys we started putting on our draft board way back. I don't even know what that would have been. Week five? Because he had A tackle, A hit power. 68, hidden dev. Perfect. We got a fun player right there. 99 hit power. I can do I can use that. I can use that for sure. I can use that. Let's go. Then we got a 72 hidden dev kicker. Hidden dev kickers don't grow on trees. At a Penn State, TJ Klein, 90 kick power, 80 accuracy. He can move a little bit. Speed acceleration. Awareness sucks. That's really what's hurting his rating. He had like a reasonable awareness. He's almost like high 70s, somewhere in that range. That is that's a draft class right there, fellas. Even taking out the low lights of the two linebackers. I mean, we go to the rest of the classes as well. The big one is Tampa Bay because they stole the linebacker that we really, really wanted in Trent Lindsay. 74, hidden dev. Probably the one that got away out of this whole draft class for me. Just be star. Just be star. I can live with it. Okay. Not bad. Good linebacker. Good for you down there in Tampa. Looking at the rest of the draft. Turns a top tier. Yeah, there we go. Caleb Jones, top. I mean, we didn't even scout him. 80. Uh, Cortez Reese, 78. Devin Logan, he was that super fast linebacker, 77. Um, pretty good players here. Guys that we had scouted. Baker, the safety at Ohio State, 76. The two quarterbacks. Let's just look at the rounds here. Two QBs. You know, at one point, we're like, we've moved on from Kyler. Alex King, 75 normal. And Stoutmeyer is 71. Has a hidden dev for the Raiders. Nice Jimmy G replacement. Okay. And, I mean, I would have leaned Stoutmeyer if we needed a quarterback for what it's worth. Shaq Bright was another player. We were kind of interested a little bit. 74 pass rusher. Now going to the Atlanta Falcons. Definitely a good Good fit for them. They need pass rush help. Star Dev, nice player. Um, hmm, was there anybody else? Anybody else that we really were considering? We did a lot of scouting on Amari Alexander. He was one of those guys that we fully scouted. That was more so when we were a 3-4 defense. Uh, undersized defensive tackle. Definitely a better fit as a 3-4 defensive end. And he is Star Dev. Uh, that's probably it, though. I, I think everyone else... Uh, Street, there. that's the last one, was the center. Why would they draft a center? You have Creed Humphrey. But he was a first-round center. We said maybe if we stayed at that Texans pick, we would consider because he was a big-time athlete. And he's only a starter. Look, my God, the guy weighs 170 pounds. So all in all, fellas, that's how you draft. I want to finish up the video by getting some UDFAs, get the roster set up for the beginning of the preseason. Uh, not some of our guys are gone like the fullback Connor is like just doesn't exist. So that's fine uh, we'll Look at the wide receivers here grid athlete somehow. I just didn't notice this guy Jamerson Andrews great name 66 95 speed 93 acceleration 93 agility. That's a I Think I got some wheels, you know give him an opportunity We got our guard Kevin Bacon who was on our draftable list fellas a UDFA out of Nebraska great name Not the actor. I don't think we're gonna give Steve Sellers a shot here because he's better than the linebackers we drafted. 66 out of Oregon State. 89 speed, 89 acceleration, 79 tackle, 78 pursuit. You know, good luck trying to make the roster. DFA corner, Ty Nixon. I'll take a dev trait, UDFA, every day of the week. But the 
end of our very first offseason here with our Madden 24 Arizona Cardinals franchise. Here is how the squad looks entering training camp. On the offense, we have a brand new center in Norton. That is it on the offensive line. We're trying to keep the cohesion as much as we possibly can. We have a freak of nature at tight end in house who could very well be our number one target this year for Kyler Murray. Even with Holly Brown and Rondell Moore and the addition of Chase Claypool, I think there's just something. And now, now the pressure's on. We gave up a lot to ensure the service. We gave up a sure thing at Superstar. The dev trade alone is already a competition. If he's a star dev, if he's not Superstar, we gave up a Superstar on a two-year remaining rookie contract to bring him in. If he ends up being a star, you know, you would have to ask the question, are we really any further ahead? Was that a, a deal worth doing? So a lot of pressure on House. Um, skill position spots. We'll keep Corey Clement as RB1. Hasn't done enough to lose that spot. Michael Carter showed in flashes. But Bonds is hot on the heels to try and become RB1 for the Arizona Cardinals this season. And, of course, we're running it back with Kyler Murray, Clayton Toon at quarterback. On the defense, front seven. Ojolari's first full season as an X-Factor. Going to continue his development so that we can unlock more abilities that we can utilize in-game. And Boogie Basham is going to get the start right now as our other pass rusher. But a gigantic boost on Cameron Thomas, who was like a high 60s outside linebacker. Jumped up to a 74 defensive end. Uh, I definitely want to see what he can do during the preseason. We have Alex Jones and Kinlaw are going to be our two defensive tackles. Raekwon Davis joined uh, by free agency. we got Warmack there as well. Rest of the front seven, Zayvon Collins, Owen Popo, and Kaiser White. We'll make up our linebacker core in this brand new kind of 4-3 defense. Going from a 3-4 last season. At safety, Jalen Thompson, the third leading tackler in the NFL. Looks to make an impression as a superstar. And continue to really fill the, the role that Buda Baker had. Grant Delpit was our lone free agency signing at safety. We got Keith Taylor and then Rutledge, the 99 hit power safety seventh round pick. You know, he's, you know, it's Keith. I mean, we got Keith, but... Uh, that guy there, I think, has a has an opportunity to become a really, really fun player for us in this franchise. And, of course, in the secondary, outside of Francois, Garrett Williams, Michael Wilson, the addition of C.J. Henderson. Shout out to Madden 23 Panthers. We have the first overall pick, Kenny Hodges, out of Syracuse. Absolute dog, man. Absolute dog. I think, obviously, in hindsight, if we had to go House or Hodges, even rating aside, I think Hodges is the right pick. You know, if we had to go a different universe and still have Trey McBride and went with Hodges at one and we stayed at pick 27, I think I would be able to live with that because Hodges is that damn good, easily the number one pick in this draft. But the fact that we got both of our guys, the hype is officially started for year two of our Madden 24 Arizona Cardinals franchise mode. So thank you guys for tuning in to the complete offseason. I very much appreciate it. As always, your first time stopping by, don't be afraid to hit that subscribe button. Smash the like button if you enjoyed Everything here. Who do you think is going to be the star? It's going to be House. Is somehow Bonds going to be an absolute monster for us in the backfield? Is Hodges going to be a guy that gets four or five interceptions? Is Alex Jones going to stop the conspiracy theories and be a force as a nose tackle? Is Rutledge going to assault Keith Taylor and Delpit and somehow become a starter? Who knows? Who knows? The way everything's going to happen, let me know in the comment section below. I'll see you guys back in the next one. Till then, it's Boise 4. Peace out. Love ya. Have a good one.